Hello, and welcome to We Speak CVE, a free podcast from the CVE program. On this podcast, we'll talk with people from the cybersecurity community about what else? Cybersecurity and vulnerability management and the CVE catalog of vulnerabilities. If you didn't know, the CVE program's mission is to identify, define, and catalog publicly disclosed cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Todd. I am a senior cybersecurity assessment engineer in the CVE program. And joining us is Larry Cashdollar, who is an independent researcher and a CVE numbering authority, also known as a CNA, within his own right. And Larry, would you like to further introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, that's me, Larry Cashdollar. Um, I've been a, a security researcher since probably the late 90s, um, I guess before it was so popular. And uh, I've been a, um, a CNA for, I think, about four or five years now. Uh, I kind of lost count. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, four or five years as a CNA. Um how how does that exactly work? I, I know that when you joined the program, you were doing independent research and you had a lot that you could possibly publish. So what, what was that journey like? So uh, I had been finding vulnerabilities for, uh, I guess it's over, at the time, it was about, this was 2016, uh, so I'd started in 98, 99. Um, I had been finding vulnerabilities for, I guess, at the time, 17 years. And uh, I was doing a, a research project where I had downloaded all 50,000 WordPress plugins. And I had created a system that would automate checking plugins for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And then the system not only would automate generating a advisory, but it would also automate creating a proof of concept exploit and then testing the exploit. And I thought from this research, I would have generated over a thousand uh, new vulnerabilities all at once. Yeah. So I had, I had spoke with the, the CVE program uh, about my intent to possibly release uh, over a thousand new vulnerabilities and what they might uh, think I should do about that. And uh, I didn't get a response. So I figured they probably were either uh, thinking that I was lying or um, that they were already busy with all the other CVEs that they were assigning at the time. Uh, so I had just gone on my merry way and um, had made this research and then uh, ended up presenting it at the Wall of Sheep. Uh, it was at DEF CON. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, I was in the audience. Well, I, I was speaking up on stage about um, my attempt to, to contact and, uh, and then mentioned that, you know, I didn't get a response. And it turned out there were uh, a few folks from the CVE program in the audience. And um, uh, one of them, Dan, had uh, met with me. Well, after some joking, we had joked about um, there was some contention, I thought, between me and the CVE program folks. Uh, which turned out to be not true uh, because I had been asking for CVE IDs for so long. And then I was always thinking that they were probably frustrated with me asking them for CVE IDs. And um, so we, you know, Dan and I had this back and forth where um, I said, if, if I'm missing after my talk, look in that guy's trunk. And Dan said, you have to look in several trunks. So <laughs> it was, uh, it, we had this good joke with each other during my, my, my presentation. And afterwards, um, Dan says, Hey, you know, you're out of Cambridge. Why don't you come to the, our campus up in, um, Bedford, Massachusetts. And, um, I said, sure. So I think it was Bedford mass or I forget where the campus is located, but, um, so, you know, I made some jokes on Twitter about, um, you know, going up there. And, and for those of you who are old enough to remember the never ending story, uh, they, they go to see the Southern Oracle and, the, and there's a, a knight who gets annihilated by the Southern Oracle with lasers shooting out of its eyes. And I was joking about that on Twitter about, you know, me going to, to see the folks at the CVE program and them annihilating me with lasers. But they said it was the other way around. 
So uh, we ended up, I ended up going there and we had a really good conversation about um, this new CNA program where they would allow companies and folks like myself to become their own numbering authority where I could assign my own CVE IDs. And I was the guinea pig for pretty much the, you know, a, a researcher in that program. Um, and they sort of knighted me uh, at that point. And uh, I, you know, went over the documentation with them um, and then uh, became my own um, CVE CNA and then started assigning my own vulnerabilities or my own CV IDs, my own vulnerabilities, which was, was really awesome. So it was a really great, uh, really great asset to have and a good feather in my cap for getting my own research done and actually uh, published. So it was a really cool thing. It was a cool story behind it too, to, to be invited up there. And then, you know, got to beat all the, all the folks in the CVE program who were these mysterious people that I just knew their names, but never knew their faces or what they sounded like, or, you know, who they were. And it was just, pretty cool to connect all that. So yeah, it, was, it was a good, good time, fun, fun experience. Yeah. And again, how long did that entire process take from the wall of sheep to you being in the program as an official CNA? I think it was only a matter of weeks. Cause I, I had scheduled, we had scheduled my meeting with them. I think maybe two weeks after we all got back from DEF CON and then I think I had sent them uh, my email address and my contact information and my website where I published my advisories and um, I had gone through all the documents and everything. And I, I think I had gotten my first list of numbers, maybe three to four weeks after that, that, uh, that initial encounter with, with the, the CVE folks. So um, it was pretty quick. It was, you know, and it was pretty efficient too. Um, there's a lot of good communication between us, which was nice. Oh, that's cool. So, um, at, at this point, to your uh, recollection, at least, how many CVEs have you published as a CNA? I think as a CNA, um, I think over a hundred. Um, I know I have th over three hundred to my name. Um, I have a friend that, that worked at the IBM X Force who's got a database that kept track of all my CVE IDs. And he said, yeah, I have 312. Um, but he has more in his database than I have in mine because when I was first doing this, um, I didn't have any real organizational skills when it came to uh, publishing my own vulnerabilities. They were text files on a web server. Um, and then other vulnerability database folks came to me and said, can you make this searchable? It's really annoying to search through your, your vulnerabilities and it's all in text. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do that. Cause I didn't realize that people actually keep track of this stuff. So, um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think it's no. around, I think it's around a hundred. I think it's my own CNA and then 200 plus before that. So. Yeah. And I think you had told me uh, at one point, it's like you said here that you had over a thousand that could have possibly been published. Yeah. So what happened with that was uh, I, I did this research and then I, I ran this uh, my, my little script and program to, to automate this. And I was watching my log files and I saw these um, the, the code was to go and it would create a proof of concept exploit. And then it would go and check to see if the proof of concept exploit worked and it would log it to a file if it did. And I saw this file, I was watching my log file and I saw these proof of concept exploits that were actually working, come in and check in if they had worked and I was getting all excited. And then when the program finished or the, 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 I guess the program I had written had finished, I had 30 of them in the log file and I was expecting way more than that. So I went back through and looked at my notes and looked at what I did and realized that I had cut corners where I, I didn't actually put the entire WordPress plugin in with the, uh, with the testing software. So what would happen is some of the code was looking for pieces of its plugin, the, the WordPress files that I were, was testing were looking for to include other pieces of WordPress or the WordPress plugin itself and couldn't find them. So just throw a 500 error. So I had made a big, a big mistake there. 
and uh, and some of the other uh, files there were um, they were being either mangled or partially sanitized across site scripting payloads I was using. Um, so I ended up with about 30 proof of concept tested vulnerabilities total out of the 1300 that I was initially expecting or so. So uh, I ended up presenting this at uh, Boston B-sides. And, um, you know, I was saying that I was trying to go, you know, to DEF CON and speak at DEF CON all about this research. And uh, Ming Chao was in the audience because he was, I guess, setting up that that B-sides and with, with uh, some other folks at Wallace Sheep. And he's like, well, he's like, you're not going to go to DEF CON with this, but you'll definitely be speaking at Wallace Sheep. And I'm like, oh, really? And he's like, yeah, yeah, you know, you'll be able to speak at Wallace Sheep with this. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, keep in touch with you about it. And I just sort of left it uh, aside. And then um, he uh, contacted me like a couple of days later. He's like, so he's like, you're all set to speak at the wall of sheep. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, so where do I send my, my uh, call for paper document? He's like, no, no. He's like, I, he's like, I accepted you there. You're speaking. You don't need to submit a call for papers. Like, just give me a summary. You're, you, you have a time slot Saturday morning at 11 AM. And I'm like, oh, oh my yeah. wow. He's like, yeah, you're all set. So I was all excited and really nervous to, to, to speak there, but um, that research ended up sort of, eh, it, it, it sort of fell apart, uh, but I covered where I had gone wrong. And actually I was told that some other presentations had used my research to highlight their own research where they had gone wrong and how, you know, attempting something and then having failures is a good learning mechanism. And a lot of people don't talk about their failures uh, when they're doing research. It's all about sex and, and um, not about, you know, Hey, I made this mistake and I went wrong. So yeah, uh, it was kind of a good, a little, a little thing to open people up to saying, Hey, I attempted this and it didn't quite work, but here's what I learned. So it was a uh, kind of like a, a nice little tidbit for people to, to start presenting on stuff they've attempted, but didn't quite work, but sort of did. So um, yeah. So, so yeah. for the products in your scope, um, you you tend to go to a, a vendor CNA if possible. Right. You know, to make sure that it's it's within their scope. And right. um, then then um, there's the thing about quality write ups, you know, having having a five word public posting just saying this is this um that's not what you do is it no one of the things that got me uh as a guinea pig in the in the cve program was that the folks at at you know the cve would do that did the documentation you folks uh liked my advisories because i made sure that they were full of detail you know they, they typically want you know what the software product is you're testing, what versions are, are affected, where'd you download it from, you know, where in the code is the vulnerability that you found? Uh, is there a proof of concept exploit that you could provide to demonstrate that it's an exploitable vulnerability? And in some cases, you know, possibly adding a patch. So I, I try to do as much as I could for, for vulnerabilities that I was disclosing. And uh, the, the, the folks at the CD program really appreciated that. So that was one of the reasons why they thought I would be a good subject to, to do the testing on with, with uh, being a CNA because I already knew how to write the advisories and my advisories were consistent. You know, I, I, I tried to make them well-worded and where they could be easily digested by, by folks who were, you know, reading the, the email list. Um, and that was a plus for, for me getting, a, becoming a pilot for the CNA program. So. Yeah. And you talked about organizing your own database and that makes it easier for CNAs and the community at large. And it's less overhead um, for everybody to not have to dig through the bits and parts. But what do you see as the value for yourself and other CNAs, especially those who are considering for me, it was being able to assign a unique ID to my own internal database that would translate to the outside world. So, you know, I had a database of, you know, 300 vulnerabilities. 
Um, if I could have a CVE ID assigned by myself that I knew would eventually translate to the outside world and made it tracking much easier and organization much easier for me. Um, initially, when I first started my database, I had VDB IDs of my own that started at you know 27 because I'd messed up the database and kept dropping tables and whatnot. And, and those ran through you know 300 or 327. So that wasn't you know a good way to track vulnerabilities. But if I had an I you know my actual CVE ID that I could say, well, this CVE ID is unpublished, but I'm going to give it you know CVE number 9204. And, you know, the date is 2019, I can easily take that number and, uh, you know, know that when I publish this vulnerability, that I can find that vulnerability on the CVE database using that number on my database and their database. So you yeah. tied everything together nicely. So there's, there's actually a good correlation factor, not just that you can do, but others can as well. Yes. So if you've, you know, if you have vulnerabilities that you've discovered on your software internally, you can assign a CVE ID right then and there that will be able to track to your, you know, to your uh, customers that can say, oh, you know, this CVE ID has been addressed with this patch and it translates internally and externally. So it's, it's, it's nice. And then it, that can also cross between vendors and CNAs, you know, when a CVE ID becomes public. Right. It's not just for that vendor. It is for the community. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, at this point, it, it's easier to assign your own, correlate it, and keep some of the confusion to a minimum if possible. Right. It, 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 it reduces the confusion when you're sorting, you know, multiple disclosures, at least on my end, um, especially when I had multiple CVE IDs or multiple vulnerabilities for a product, um, you know, it was hard for me to say, well, you know, I found a vulnerability in upload.php and download.php and admin.php. Um, and then, you know, admin.php had two actual vulnerabilities where the other two had one each. Instead, I had CVE IDs that, that correlated to each one of those vulnerabilities and each one of those files. And it was just easier to just have a number that I wouldn't have to change again later because it would be eventually published publicly on the, on the CVE website. So um, yeah, it's very handy. And you address those through the CNA rules. Yes. Um, yes. So, you know, those are publicly listed and posted. Um, yeah. And, you know, you're, you're pretty much just making sure that you adhere to those rules? Yeah, you know, I, I occasionally will go through, if, I, if my memory starts to get a little foggy, I'll go through the, uh, the number of the vulnerability number uh, counting system document and just go through and just verify that um, <laughs> I'm doing it the correct way. Because uh, in some cases, you know, it's, it's do I remember correctly if, if this is in, two separate pieces of code and the same function, or if it's outside of this function, but in a different, if a different PHP file or C file. So I go back and I, I check the document now and then too, uh, just to refresh my memory because I'm getting older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I understand that feeling. So, I mean, as far as, uh, is there anything else you would like to discuss just from your perspective questions that haven't um, been asked. I don't have any questions on my end. I, I just think, you know, if, if, if you've got a, uh, you know, a, a software shop or, a, or a, a company that, you know, you are looking at vulnerabilities or, or publishing vulnerabilities and becoming a CNA is probably a great idea because uh, it just helps organizationally and, and management wise, um, keeping track of, you know, your disclosures internally and externally. It's, it's just a, it's so much easier. So it was for me yeah. and I, you know, I'm and not as big as a lot of places. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been doing this for five or six years. Yeah. Just as a CNA. Um, and it was, it was pretty, pretty awful before that. I mean, it was my 
organization was a big mess before that. So this helped me out a whole lot. All right. That's very cool. So for everybody, um, this has been Larry Cash Dollar, who is a CV numbering authority, a CNA. And we thank you for the insight into your process and your experiences within the CNA program and the CVE program. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us today on the We Speak CVE podcast, which is available for free on Buzzsprout and the CVE website. If you'd like to participate or suggest a topic, please contact us on the CVE website.